<laughs> Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the virtual lecture, Understanding the San Isidro Movement from a Historical Perspective by Marie-Laure Joffrey. My name is Jorge Duani. I'm a director of the Cuban Research Institute at Florida International University, Miami, which organized today's event. As many of you know, our topic is particularly timely because of the call for a civic march for change in Cuba and supporting demonstrations in more than 100 cities around the world. I hope that our lecture today will illuminate the roots of the current political unrest in Cuba, especially among uh, journalists, uh, writers, and artists. <coughs> Before proceeding, let me remind you that you can submit questions during and after the talk using the ask a question button at the bottom of your screen. Now compile these questions at the end of the talk and pose them to our speaker after the presentation. I'm pleased to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Marie-Laura Geoffrey, who is an associate professor of political science at the Institute for Latin American Studies at the Sorbonne Nouvelle University in Paris. She's also currently a Fulbright visit visiting scholar at FIU's Cuban Research Institute. She earned her PhD, summa cum laude, in political science from the Sciences Po at the University of Paris, and held a postdoctoral fellowship at the Free University of Berlin. She also holds a master's degree in international cooperation and development from the University of Paris One Sorbonne, a master's degree in English with honors from the Sorbonne University Nouvelle Paris uh, Three, and a bachelor's degree in English from the Ecole Normale Supérieure. Her research interests include transnational collective action, culture and politics, socialism and communism memory and transitional justice in Latin America, especially Cuba. She is the author of the book, Contesté a Cuba, Contestation in Cuba, published in 2012, based on 11 months of field work on the island. She's also the co-editor of two volumes of the book, Amérique Latine, published in 2016 and 2015. She has published numerous articles and reviews in academic journals, such as the Journal for Latin American Studies, the Review de Chico Comparative SOS, Cahier des Amériques Latines, Cuadernos Latinoamericanos, and Revue Francaise de Sciences Politiques. She's also written several book chapters, including a recent one for Cuba's Digital Revolution, edited by Ted Hankin and Sara Garcia Santa Maria, which we presented uh, earlier this year, and another one for the book Cuba, Ajuste o Transición, edited by Belia Cecilia Bobes in 2015. His lecture in many countries, including France, the Netherlands, Germany, the United Kingdom, Spain, Romania, the United States, Canada, Vietnam, and Cuba. Without further ado, I give you Dr. Marino. So hello everyone. Uh, I first want to thank um, Jorge Duani and the Cuban Research Institute for offering me a wonderful Fulbright research semester at FIU um, from August until the end of November. And I also want uh, to thank them for allowing me to present my work in the seminar. Um, today is a very special day and it's a bit strange to be talking here well, I suppose our eyes should be on what's going on in Cuba right now. And at the same time, it's a good opportunity to put this demonstration, or I don't know if it's going to be a demonstration in March, the quinceane into perspective, because in the end, that's what we do as scholars. We focus somewhat less on hot events than on providing in-depth analysis of these events, which includes understanding their genealogy, their dynamics, and their effects on the long run. So this is what I'll try and do today. Um, so first, I would like to give a bit of context to my presentation. It is about the San Isidro movement, which I suppose most of you know, which consists in an artistic and uh, activist endeavor to contribute to social and political change in Cuba. It emerged in Havana in 2018, when a few artists and intellectuals started opposing a law called Decreto 349, which basically made it very hard for independent artists to keep working and making a living thanks to their art. 
So because the emergence of the San Isidro movement had some, somehow coincided with the full liberalization of uh, the internet in Cuba, it has received very broad coverage, both in the mainstream media and on social networks. It's been compared to Charter 77 in Czechoslovakia and with other forms of artistic and uh, activism in communist countries. It has been celebrated as the new artistic movement, which could finally lead to open a dialogue with the authorities because of what happened in, um, on the 27th of November, 2020, when hundreds of artists and intellectuals demanded a change in cultural policy in front of the Ministry of Culture, and more broadly, when they demanded real respect for freedom of speech and organization in, in Cuba. But few of those uh, newspapers and research has stressed the roots of the San Isidro movement. And that's what I want to do here because I had the chance to conduct field work on contentious artistic movements in Cuba in the 2000s, when the first movements of the 21st century were being formed, which allowed me to have a more in-depth understanding of uh, everything that led to the San Isidro movement, because it is a hair of the collectives which emerged at that time. So this presentation will present a tentative genealogy of the uh, movement and then focus on what is new, actually new as far as uh, this movement. This presentation draws on the work I've done as a political sociologist and on the dynamics of protest in Cuba since 2005. And to analyze this type of protest, I rely on um, the theory of Pierre Bourdieu, his theory of fields and social spaces. This theory is, a, uh, I know it's well known in the US, but it, it is especially famous in France where it has inspired uh, very many political scientists and sociologists. Um, the fields are defined in Bourdieu's theory as relatively autonomous social spaces, which means that they are entry costs to get into those spaces. Those spaces are defined by specific rules and specific objectives. And these um, leads them to build frontiers between the outside world and the inner world of those fields. And those fields are also led by specific professionals, people who become professional of those fields and cannot easily travel to other fields, for instance. Um, this uh, theory has led to, uh, there's a, I'm sorry, there's a small problem with the PowerPoint, but um, it has led to uh, the crafting of other um, modes of theorization of social space. People have used uh, Bourdieu's theory to talk about subfields or spheres or social spaces, which is not autonomous enough to be real fields of power, but had a kind of uh, intricacy, had entry costs, had specific rules, and the, the protest space has been defined as, as one of those. I'm also drawing on, on Michel Dobry's uh, work. Dobry is a heir of Pierre Bourdieu. He wrote a book that has not been translated into English, which is um, which is a pity, Sociologie des crises politiques in 1986, because in that book, Dobry is, uses Bourdieu's theory of fields to understand how, in a kind of, a, in the context of a political crisis, fields can become what he calls actually, he actually calls them sectors, because then he uses the notion of desectorization, meaning that different fields are not uh, as um, defined as much as, as, uh, as they're normally defined, as uh, fields with their own rules and, 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 and objectives, et cetera, but they become uh, different, they become fluid. There's this kind of fluid, fluidity between those different fields, which allows for, um, for um, the crisis to take place and um, for the social and political situation to be somehow undefined. And those two um, theories are interesting for my argument here because I draw on them to understand how artists in Cuba take advantage of the relative liberalization and autonomization of the um, cultural sphere, which has become open to the market, to use their freedom not only to compete on the market and become professional artists recognized internationally, but also to question the monopoly of the Communist Party on the political sphere. So I argue that they have played a very important role by doing so in legitimizing social and political protest. So let's go back to the San Isidro movement and its roots. Um, since the beginning of, uh, of the Cuban revolution, the cultural and intellectual spheres have hosted 
critical debates about the form taken by the Cuban government. There were, but the problem is, problem is there were debates, but there were also constant ruptures between the movements that, um, um, that organized those debates. There was a lack of transmission and there were memory gaps between generations. And because of those ruptures, um, those movements only led to the emergence of fragmented micro spaces of contention, which could only reach very small and segmented audiences. I take three examples, which span the first three decades post-59. Uh, Ediciones al Puente, Journal Pensamiento Crítico, and Grupo Arte Calle. So the first one, Ediciones al Puente, um, it was a literary endeavor which gave some space to new uh, poetic and literary voices at the beginning of the revolution. It was mostly mixed race and black poets, often from working class backgrounds, and some of them were gay and lesbians. It was an important endeavor because it managed to carve itself a space between 61 and 66 and to publish quite a few works and become recognized but it underwent harsh repression at the time and some of uh, its uh, protagonists were sent to the UMAPs. Others were the constantly harassed and arrested. So many went into exile and the others went into internal, what has been called internal exile, like uh, Nancy Morejon, who is one of the most well-known um, protagonists of, uh, of this group. So because of that, only a very specific audience actually knew about El Puente and discussed um, what El Puente had brought to the literary world of Cuba um, when I did field work in Havana in, in the 2000s, when the black literature specialists were actually interested in this. So there was not much that was um, understood and taken from this initiative at that time. Another example is Pensamiento Critico, which was active from 67 to 71. Its director, who was Fernando Martinez Heredia, was harassed and he was silenced. And he was sent, for instance, to the Ministry of Agriculture and then to Nicaragua for some time. And he was just unable with all his other uh, friends, uh, Aurelio Alonso and others, to transmit their experience and their divine understanding, philosophical and political understanding of the Cuban uh, revolutionary process until the end of the 1990s and the 2000s. So when I met him, his, his home was generally filled with students, some of whom went to create Observatorio uh, critico um, that that took some of um, the uh, post-Marxist or neo-Marxist understanding of the revolutionary process. Uh, there were all those people who were interested in heterodox Marxism, but again, it was another small intellectual bubble. And finally, I want to mention Arte Calle, uh, who, which is uh, today very famous, and it was somewhat famous also in Havana when it emerged at the end of the 1980s. Um, especially with the unfinished Viva la Revolu, the, the graffiti Viva la Revolu. But here again, there was a blackout during the 1990s because uh, some went into exile, others didn't uh, talk at all. So very few people had heard of them when I uh, was doing field work in, in Cuba in the 2000s. And for instance, when I asked some performance artists like the Omni Sona Franca, I'm going to talk about them later, if they were inspired by Arte Calle or by other people like Angel Delgado, they actually didn't know about them at the time. So I had to tell them who they were. And that was interesting because I could see at that time that this had happened with very many other initiatives like Paideia, like Criterio Alternativo, Tercera Opción, Asociación Pro Arte Libre. I knew more about all those initiatives than the people who were actually um, creating new projects in Cuba at the time. Uh, and this is linked to uh, the waves of exile, the recurring waves of exile, but also the fact that those who stayed remained to stay silent. And I remember I asked once a prominent former member of Paideia, who was still in Cuba, about the initiative, and he told me he didn't want to talk about it because he didn't want to open what he called the Pandora box. So for those reasons, despite the persistent emergence of alternative and critical artistic and intellectual projects throughout the 1980s and 1990s, these projects only gave way to the building of fragmented and segmented contentious spaces, which moreover only had a temporary existence. Sorry, I forgot to pass this slide. So my second point uh, will um, consider the 2000, when uh, change was brought, um, when the cultural sphere was open to the market for financial reasons and reasons of political marketing also for the Cuban government, 
more freedom was granted to uh, professional artists and our intellectuals, and this has been well documented, so I won't dwell on that. Uh, it has allowed artists and intellectuals to obtain privileges, this has been studied by Yvonne Grenier, to pursue artistic careers and to engage in a kind of safe criticism. This has been studied by someone like Jeff Baker, for instance. Um, and although this criticism was constrained, it actually led to the opening of the cultural sphere and to the emergence of a more intricate contentious space at the margins of the cultural sphere. And this is something I especially studied when I was doing field work in Cuba. So this means uh, the hip hop movement, Omnisona Franca and the Poesia Sin Fin festivals, rock bands like Porno para Ricardo, the Catedral de Santa Maria, the workshops they did at the Asociación Hermano Saiz, the Juan Marinello Center, the Coco Solo Social Club, the Rotilla Festival of Electronic Music, and the Mongeles. These people met and interacted in very many peñas and tertulias, which sometimes led to alternative literary or music publications, such as Cacharos, Movimiento, or Lunes de Post Revolución, and many more. And these endeavors, they merged with little memory of former initiatives, as I said, but interestingly enough, they reproduced many ways of organizing and doing things from their predecessors, the informal, the performative and the open attitude to dialogue with authorities, for instance. But there were also new elements, something that were different, uh, especially um, two of them. The first one is that the members of those movements were mostly younger, poorer, and less formally educated and less professionally legitimate people. They were also more often black and mixed race. They often came from families who had benefited from the revolutionary process, as their parents had received a formal education or professional training, especially in the 60s, despite coming from rural communities, being macheteros or maids or peasants or workers. And many of those parents had obtained positions which gave them responsibilities in the revolutionary institutions, like local dirigentes, civil servants and ministries, sometimes given in Minint or Minfar. Now, despite this upward mobility, these families often still lived in working class neighborhoods in the 1980s, 1990s, sorry, and these neighborhoods were especially stricken by the economic crisis. So they became socially and economically marginalized and this situation allowed for more freedom of action. And this explains why Santa Cruz del Norte, Guiteras, or Alamar, I'm talking about Havana, were the places, for instance, where the graffiti movement was especially strong. Uh, I even talked to, um, to local authorities there, members of the uh, Communist Party, of, of the local um, uh, cultural, um, cultural uh, institutions, and these people would say that they would let it be, um, and that, for instance, the paint would not be erased, people would be allowed to go on with the festivals, because they said it lent some colors to the dilapidated urban places, and at least it would keep the youth um, occupied, busy, and not engaged into illegal uh, trafficking, for instance, or illegal activities. So this is the second element, is that the members of those new movements used their neighborhoods as places to experiment. They promoted the participation of the audience in their activities. Rappers and performers would organize work workshops for kids. They would stage live performances for the community. They would engage with the social reality of their neighbors. For instance, social science students would organize commemorations of forgotten historical events with marginalized communities like the Abacuas. And of course, the many festivals allowed to gather throngs of young urban people. So this way of being rooted in their local social environment, both sociologically because of who they were and through their actions, working not only as artists or as intellectuals, but also as group of friends, relatives, neighbors and acquaintances, these allowed these initiatives to find wider audiences to become locally famous, sometimes more, and thus to gain popular support within their communities despite their critical stance. Thanks to these local rootedness, all these endeavors have allowed for the crafting of some kind of collective organization with informal, horizontal, and socially inclusive practices. And they became proofs that it was possible to organize from below and even critically discuss the achievements and failures of the revolutionary process at the margins of the official institutions. 
And finally, these collectives managed to craft a wider contentious space as they constantly collaborated with one another. Because they were not professional artists or intellectuals, meaning they were not UNEAC members or professors at University of Havana, for instance, they didn't have a real professional status. And because of that, they cared less about professional boundaries and they were less involved in professional competitive dynamics. So this allowed them to organize constant exchanges and collaborations between them. For instance, rappers would invite historians to their festivals to discuss about the history of race in Cuba or Omnis um, Franca would invite social science students to participate in their performances. These constant exchanges gave way to an incredible project, which is completely unknown today because it didn't lead to any concrete formal or visible initiatives. It was called Voltu Cinco. It was linked to um, a popular cartoon in Cuba, uh, which meant Vamos a Unirnos. It was about unity. And in the, at the time, it united tens of small collectives at the end of the 2000s. It was artists, bloggers, intellectuals, tech nerds, anthropologists, environmental activists, feminists, and anti um, racist activists, and more. So it was one of the first um, uh, process of uniting very many different collectives, not behind one idea, but as an articulation. So of course, this was also possible at the time because all these endeavors played in the ambiguity of artistic performance or intellectual debate to convey alternative meanings and manners to inhabit and understand the revolutionary process. So they maintain a kind of barrier between themselves and the dissident movement in order to maintain a kind of safe space. But nonetheless, others collectives also played with political red lines. Um, sorry. They constantly experimented and tried to push boundaries. For instance, it was the members of the groups, of those groups who were the very people who organized the demonstration against violence, uh, which took place on the 6th of November in 2009. It's a demonstration that many people have forgotten about today, but De Mongeles, one of those collectives, uh, was part of it. Omnisona Franca was part of it. The Catedra de Santa Maria was part of it. Um, and other environmental activists like uh, Isabel Diaz, for instance. And the very, this very demonstration was an important moment because it, it was repressed, of course. And Ioannis Sanchez and Orlando Luis Pardolazo, who wanted to join it as bloggers, never, ma never made it because they were kidnapped uh, by the state security um, and led to another place far away and brutally beaten. Today, the organizers of this march are, are part of Archipelago, who, um, who organized the march that is supposed to take place uh, today. I want to turn to the legacy of these collectives. For me, the, their legacy is the fact that they managed to create a de-segmented contentious social space. Why do I mean by de-segmented? I mean that all those small bubbles I, talk, I talked about earlier in this presentation came together. So at the turn of the 2000s, there was a new wave of repression. And as, a, as again, as before, it led to trajectories of exile. For instance, almost half of the people who were part of Omnisana Franca at this time are here in Miami. The same happened with the rap movement. So a lot of rappers emigrated to the US with De Mongeles, with the organizer of the Rotilla festivals and with members of rock band Porno Barra Ricardo to, to cite just a few. But this time, the effects of this uprootedness were not the same. They were continuities. First of all, there's a newfound continuity between those collectives of the 2000 and the San Isidro movement because quite a few people who stayed did not go silent. They did not go silent and they were part of this new initiative that emerged thanks to younger artists like Luis Manuel uh, Otero Alcantara. Here's a, an image of this intergenerational um, group of people. Some of them are in the late 20s and some of them are over 50. This is something that's very new. Um, some of these artists, like Tania Bruguera, are even coming back and forth in Cuba, and this became possible after 2013, when people could leave the island and come back um, more easily than, than before. So this has allowed artists to engage in, in international careers while remaining in Cuba or to live abroad and come back for long periods of time. And this has allowed for the memory of the former experiences to be still alive on the island and to be shared with younger people, which was not possible before. 
And other kind of continuity was allowed by the learning processes which took place in the 2000s. Because the collectives I studied were not only as artistic spaces for inspiration, for creation, creativity, but also as social spaces in which people became socialized to other ways of perceiving their reality, of interpreting it. They learned to organize together with scarce resources. They learned to carve a space for themselves despite censorship and repression. And together they promoted values which departed from those they had been inculcated. For instance, they learned to express themselves without too much fear, to be bolder, to trust one another, to be critical, to believe in other ways of creating collective endeavors outside of state institutions and supervision. They also learned to debate with one another in a respectful way, although I must say some debates could be quite heating, heated sometimes. So to put it in a nutshell, those spaces were real incubators at the time. And this was made possible because contrary to what happened in the 60s, 70s and 80s, a time where initiatives were disbanded after two, three or maximum five years, those collectives existed for a long period of time, 10 years, 15 years, and sometimes more if we consider the rap movement, for instance, or the visual arts network organized around Tanya Bouguera. This was also possible because of the spatial rootedness of these initiatives in the Galleria de Arte de la Mar, where Omnisona Franca had its uh, gallery, the Coco Solo Social Club, music studios like Real 70 at Papa Umbertico's house. Papa Umbertico was a rapper with an extraordinary generosity and opened his studio to all the rappers in, in Havana. And thanks to this longer temporality and to these spatial logics of social dynamics, there were learning processes between generations. People who are members of the San Isidro today circulating in those spaces. And I can, I can quote at least two very important names, Luis Manuel Otero Alcantara, who was part of Tania Bruguera's Arte de Conducta workshops, and Ana Mani Ramos, who circulated uh, wide uh, among in, in those spaces. And finally, the liberalization of access to the internet has also allowed for the continuous flow, flow of information and communication across borders. Uh, and here, independent Cuban journalists have played an important role. They have participated in the building of a memory of um, previous contention, contentious artistic and intellectual in endeavors. They are clearly part of a more global initiative of looking at the past with the will to get to know their roots better. And they are among the few voices who have emphasized the legacies of previous collectives in the more contemporary San Isidro movement, especially uh, Cuba Encuentro, uh, Generacion Y, Yoani Sanchez blog, but also Havana Times, and more recently ADN Cuba and El Estornudo. They have, for instance, produced pieces about De Mongeles, about Paidea, and about Omnisona Franca to recall that there were people who have worked before the San Isidro movement to bring about change. So there is a clear, clear legacy of those previous collectives, which shows that uh, the uh, San Isidro movement emerged and organized thanks to them. A legacy of working at the local level with the community in working class neighborhoods. A legacy of, uh, of uh, engaging in dialogue with all kinds of people, as well as with the authorities, as exemplified by the, um, the, what happened at 27th of November in 2020 a legacy of interaction, debate, and cross-fertilization between different spheres, what I call the dynamics of desegmentation of contentious social spaces, because all those initiatives, they emerge in the artistic sphere, but actually connect with the political world. Um, and um, here, I wanted to show a small picture by, with uh, Amaury Pacheco and Cuesta Morua, something that was not possible when I was working in Havana in the in the 2000 because there was a clear um, difference and a clear frontier between artistic contentious movements and the opposition, which is not uh, the case today anymore. So these are the legacies from previous movements to the San Isidro movement, and at the same time, the San Isidro movement has innovated innovated in many ways. So my last part is about those new contentious. Uh, dy dynamics, what is new with the San Isidro movement? Well, first of all, it's a movement that has brought together a galaxy of people who belong to the art world, as always, artists, curators, producers, but who also share other identities, such as human rights defenders, 
independent journalists and activists. And, and, and there are people who defend these identities. They are artists and human rights defenders. They are artists and journalists or artists and activists. Uh, so prior to, um, to the campaign against the uh, Decreto um, 349, that this law, uh, which prohibited de facto independent artists from uh, working, artists almost always rejected any other kind of, of social identity because it was safer to do so. And we can still see that today. But the San Isidro movement has brought a proud defense of these multiple identities. They have connected with more traditional dissident movements in a much more visible way than former collectives used to do. And they have also imported um, some of the, the traditional dissidents repertoire of action. And here I showed um, a picture of Luis Manuel Otero Alcantara with the L for liberty and libertad as a means of identification, communication, and claims making. It is also the case with the hunger strike, which was really part of the repertoire of the uh, dissident movement. But here again, they innovated because they used this, um, this form of action to uh, as a collective um, way of, of, of doing things. For instance, when Michael Osorbo, this rapper, was, um, was arrested and he went for a hunger strike in his cell, the rest of the San Isidro movement also decided to go on hunger strike and decided to go to do so together as a performance also. And this was different because they also did it in their headquarters in the San Isidro district, where their neighbors support them and, um, sorry, I don't have any electricity anymore, where the neighbors support them and uh, where they were defending against uh, police action. Um, I think I have to move to get the electricity back, so just give me one second. Yes, <laughs> wonderful, thank you. Um, secondly, the great strength of the San Isidro movement is that they have managed to garner exceptional support in the San Isidro community, um, locally, nationally among like-minded activists uh, in Cuba and internationally among human rights organizations, as well as organizations which support artists at risk. So thanks to this, they have become a kind of focal point for action in Cuba and abroad. And this is made clear by uh, the song Patria y Vida, which pays tribute to the San Isidro movement and the ex extraordinary recognition they obtain with all the, the the awards I, I put here, the Oxy Award for Luis Manuel Otero, the Grammy Awards nominations, the Decent Human Rights Award for Michael Osorbo, the Prima Velasquez the Artes Plasticas for, for Tania Bulguera. It is their capacity to, to talk to different audiences, both in Cuba and abroad, both artistic and non-artistic, both politicized and little politicized, which has enabled the, the movement to convey its critical perspective on the Cuban reality, which has appealed so broadly and in such an intergenerational way to Cubans in Cuba and abroad. So although some of its members have made more precise statements, they have generally advocated for a peaceful social change through civic and artistic means. They have stood in favor of the inclusion of all voices, all perspectives, and all Cubans, and they have not fallen into the trap of rebuilding walls between different opinions. And thanks to this, they have attracted, of course, criticism from both left and uh, right wing extremes, but they have also won the hearts and minds of everything in between, as they do not discriminate socially, artistically, or politically. So I need to conclude as time flies. And what I want to emphasize uh, for this conclusion is that the San Isidro movement has not emerged out of the blue. It is the product of the patient building of social, artistic, intellectual, and political forces in Cuba during the past 20 years. And it has thrived thanks to the dynamics of transnationalization of activism in Cuba after the liberalization of the internet. The San Isidro movement has managed to achieve what no other organization had managed before. And I believe that this is because they did not attempt at create unity, but they crafted a wide articulation of different claims voiced in different social spheres, culture, the media, human rights, and also basic daily necessities. And all of these converges around the need for a social and political change. So last and not least, this logics of articulation of claims, I believe this has launched the process of desegmentation of the artistic and intellectual sphere on the one hand and the political sphere on the other hand. The San Isidro movement has created bridges which have managed to 
create cross-fertilization between these spaces. And by doing so, they have dramatically increased the legitimacy of political process, protest in Cuba. This is why I believe their movement is key to understand how the 11th of July was possible, as well as the building of Archipelago, the largest social movement coordination that has existed in Cuba since the 1960s, and who are the organizers of today's march. So this is just uh, a small image. Um, and I just want to say that Estamos Conectados, what they use, the Sanistro movement as a, as a slogan, actually comes from Omnisona Franca. So this is a, a small bibliography I can pass on afterwards if needed. And thank you very much. Thank you, Marie Lor, for that informative and well documented and insightful presentation. I want to invite everyone again to please submit your questions on the QA button at the bottom of your screen. And in the meantime, let me start the conversation by asking you a few questions of my own. You mentioned uh, two uh, moments that I think are crucial to understand uh, San Isidro. One of them is Decreto 349 in, from 2018. Can you talk a little bit more about that? decree and how that um, galvanized uh, the members of San Isidro. And also the other um, uh, sort of uh, date of November 27, 2020, the uh, peaceful demonstration in form, from, for the, front of the uh, Ministry of Culture. How are that, how is that connected to San Isidro? Sorry, I, I, I thought I would be talking in front of a very informed audience, so I chose not to dwell on those moments, but of course, the decree 349 um, was a very important um, moment for the, um, for the creation of the San Isidro movement because it brought together people. This decree basically um, prevented um, independent artists to work uh, because um, you had to be to to have a kind of membership in a um, formal institution like the UNEAC, the uh, only um, trade union for artists uh, and intellectuals in Cuba, or another uh, institution like the RAP agency or or, or any kind of um, institutional agency. You had to be a member of, of those agencies to be able to be. Um, to, to get a job and to perform somewhere, uh, even for private uh, restaurants or um, private uh, any private venue, um, the owners would be asked uh, for your membership. That you had to have this membership to to to, to get a job. So basically, people who uh, were alternative and critical voices and who had been either expelled from those institutions or never managed to get in one of those institutions were barred from performing. Um, and because of that, they would not be able to go on uh, making a living as artists, which was already very difficult. So that's why they mobilized against it, uh, because it was uh, creating a new frontier between state artists uh, or recognized artists, recognized by the state and other artists. And they started a campaign, especially online, on social media against that decree. And they brought together artists from uh, Cuba and artists from the, from the diaspora. Um, so this was one of the campaigns launched by the uh, San Isidro movement, uh, but it was uh, not the only one, although it was the one that made them famous because it was also at the time of uh, the liberalization of, of, um, of the internet. And um, um, the, um, the 27th of, of November was a, a very important date, of course, because um, it was um, there was a whole process. Uh, Denis Solis, a rapper, uh, a friend of, the, of uh, many of the members of the San Isidro movement, was arrested um, uh, because of his critical stance, because, uh, well, whatever, you know, they, you can always invent something against uh, artists or uh, intellectuals in Cuba. And he was um, jailed. And the San Isidro movement decided um, to launch a campaign for his uh, liberation and um, in solidarity with him. And when Denis Solis started a hunger strike in, in his prison cell, then um, the members of the San Isidro movement decided they would do the same uh, in San Isidro in that district. That's what they, they did. Um, and of course, uh, what the, this campaign and this uh, moment was very monitored by the state security, by the police. Um, and um, and in the end, because also, um, 
the, what happened is that the police uh, came into um, the house where they were doing this, the hunger strike to take them out. And especially it was Manuel Otero Alcantara, who was also on a, on a thirst strike. He was not um, drinking. Um, they used the pretext that somebody had come to bring them um, uh, some supplies, um, thirst breaching the COVID-19 protocol. And they used that pretext to, to breach, to come into the house and take them all out. And that's when some of them reunited at some other points in the city and some other artists got interested into what was happening with the San Isidro movement and in solidarity with them, they started gathering on the 27th of November in front of the Ministry of, of Culture around noon. Uh, at the beginning, there were 20 of them, but very uh, fast, more and more people came. The, um, other, the protagonists of the San Isidro movement uh, who were not in hospital or they came too. And then in the end, it was a, a hundreds and hundreds of artists and intellectuals and writers who were there, including some very uh, famous ones. Uh, and what happened afterwards is that they asked for a dialogue with um, the Ministry of Culture and, um, and Fernando Rojas, the vice minister, uh, received them with a few other um, uh, officials to have this dialogue, but uh, nothing in the end really came out of it because what they actually wanted was the liberation of uh, of um, people who had been arrested, Denis Solis, especially um, Michael Zorbo, another rapper, and the end of uh, the constant harassment of uh, artists and intellectuals. Of course, this didn't happen, and we can see it up to today. Thank you. Uh, we have a few questions uh, also now, um, so I'm going to go through them. The first one uh, is how will the bibliography be circulated? I, I think I can answer that because we're going to have a recording available and uh, it is uh, at the end of the presentation, no? Uh, most of it, the bibliography. Yes? So, yes, um, of, course, of course I can circulate it. Yes. Um, oh yeah, exactly. And people can also write to us. Uh, just, yeah, just write and I'll send it. Exactly. Okay, here's a question from Monica Ravelo, uh, who wants to know if you can expand your explanation about the role of time and space in this new artistic expressions and then she adds, do you think this relationship is different from other expressions in Cuba? Absolutely. This is one thing that really interested me when I was uh, doing field work in, in Havana. I worked especially with the rap movement, with Omni Sona Franca, a collective of uh, perform performance art, um, artists, and a group of intellectuals called Catedral de Santa Maria, who later created Observatorio Critico. And I was interested in those movements rather than others because other people got interested in, of course, what happened at the time with art and artists be becoming more critical, but in, in, a, in a safe way. But what interested me is that there were movements of people who would um, meet and work together on a daily basis, organized together within their community. They often came from um, a poor marginalized community in suburban Havana, sometimes in Central Havana too. Uh, they were black, they were mixed race, they came from families that were really, had benefited from the, from the whole process, but they had become critical. And it, it gave them this kind of um, desire to do something collectively. They were not individual voices. Of course, they were also uh, individual voices because each one has an individual uh, work of art or intellectual work, but mostly they worked together and most of uh, their work were actually collective performances, collective writing, uh, collective singing, and they um, also focused on organizing things for the community, for themselves, uh, to become public, but together and to discuss with the authorities. So they managed to get spaces given, lent to them by the authorities in uh, Casas de Culturas, in other places, in the Asociación Hermanos Saiz, at the Madriguera, a famous uh, concert venue in the center of Havana. So space uh, was um, essential in, in what they did because they wanted to create new audiences. They wanted to have people react. They wanted to create a kind of civic culture by working together with those people. And some performances actually took place within buildings. Uh, inside buildings in Anama, for instance. So this uh, had a huge impact because it took art out of the elitistic uh, circles of Havana. Um, one thing for uh, space. As far as time, it's, I, I really think that the fact that these people were allowed to work and could work for 10 to 15 to 20 years, it just made them 
famous um, everywhere. And people who left and, and came back, they, they, these people were still there. You know, Artikaya, they were there for two years. Paideya, they were there for two years. When they left, they were gone. And only the people who had worked with them could actually talk about them. Whereas here, it was intergenerational. People who are 50 today and people who are 20 today, they've participated in the same spaces. So that made a, a big difference. A question from Gene Rosenberg uh, from FIU. Uh, he notes that the disappearing by the government of cultural figures who contest official ideology and the regime is a strange sensation experienced by knowledgeable foreign, foreign visitors to Cuba, such as yourself. Some of them have reappeared, particularly in scholarly spheres, after they have died and they no longer pose a threat. So the question is, to what extent is the general population across the island aware of Movimiento San Isidro and similar movements? Um, one other aspect of, of what which struck me at the time I was doing this field work is that, um, um, especially Omni Sona Franca, but also the Cathedral de Santa Maria and the rappers, they um, invested a lot of energy and resources, which were, were really scarce at the time, uh, in uh, traveling the island, in going to other places, meeting with uh, like-minded like people and communities, and performing there. So for instance, the picture I showed you of um, Omnisona Franca clad in those uh, grandma newspapers with tape on it, is actually a performance that took place in the central square of Santiago de Cuba. A lot of concert um, and underground concerts took place in many other cities. Um, same with Catedral I de Santa Maria, they had a lot of uh, people they knew across the island in different um, cities, Santa Clara, uh, Moa, where they had, uh, they knew people who uh, they had gotten into contact with, um, it would be too long to explain how, but so I believe, and 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 I, I believe these these uh, movements were known to small communities across the island. And uh, as far as San Isidro movement, they are some of the same people. And one of the performances that um, Luis Manuel Torre Cantara did was especially one one of these um, going on his own across the island, um, uh, carrying a, a Virgin Mary, a bust of Virgin Mary, and talking to people. So. Probably, of course, it's not throngs of people, it's not uh, thousands of people who have met them, but maybe hundreds of them. And because now with social networks, maybe his face tells them something. And I believe because of this, it has traveled, their image has traveled along and it means something to these people because they know somebody who knows somebody who's met them, which is very different from what had happened before. Okay. So we have a couple of related questions. Uh, one by Lawrence Whitehead, who asked, uh, since you have spoken uh, mostly about Havana, but he notes that uh, July 11 uh, of this year was uh, nationwide. And then Kathleen Hansing also uh, asked about the provinces, right? Rather than just uh, the city of Havana. And I think that you just mentioned some of that activity. Um, yes, of course. I The presentation was 30 minutes and I wanted it to be really related to uh, my scholarly work. So I didn't want to do some I didn't really want to comment uh, on the 11th of July. I haven't worked on it in a scholarly uh, manner. So I, I really wanted to keep it uh, academic. Uh, of course, the 11th of July was uh, nationwide and um, the San Isidro movement cannot on its own explain what happened uh, on the 11th of July. And I believe you actually need research to understand really what happened. But I believe that these people, because they were so connected and because they were so popular in Havana and elsewhere, because I have, as I have mentioned, what happened in Havana was something of course essential, but they took their action outside of Havana and they were known elsewhere. So I believe this made an, an impact. Um, as far as the transnational connections, yes, this is another, this is a, a huge part of, uh, of what happened and I didn't have the time to dwell on this. Uh, one of the aspects of it is that, I wanted to mention is that these people who are the new generation today, contrary to what happened in the 2000s, they have traveled to and forth everywhere. Luis Manuel de Alcantara has been many times to Europe. Um, Yanelis Nunez, who used to be uh, his partner and is now in Spain, uh, is uh, living there. She has created a kind of embassy for the San Isidro movement uh, in, in Madrid with other um, artists. They have been to uh, forums like the, 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 Prague the Forum 2000 created by uh, Václav Havel in Prague. 
um, I mean, they've traveled everywhere and they have come back with new ideas. They've been in contact with artists and intellectuals elsewhere. And this has brought a lot of, um, a lot of food for thought in Cuba. Uh, so this is one thing. And uh, that's also why I wanted to emphasize the multiple identities, the fact that they are not only defended by uh, NGOs which focus on artists at risk, for instance, like Free Muse, but they are also defended by human rights organizations like Amnesty International. So they have managed to unite, to put together um, a kind of community, not just those who defend the artists, not just those who defend the intellectuals or those who defend the dissidents, but they appeal to, to all of those organizations. And this is one of the reasons they have managed to, um, to, to, to get so much uh, support uh, outside of, of, um, of Cuba. The last thing is, for instance, as I was saying, half of Omnis from La Franca today is in Miami. Those people have created an uh, Miami San Isidro movement, uh, and last year they were especially um, active. Today um, they they have just started. They will have a 24-hour Poesia Sin Fin festival, a kind of a reacting of what they used to do in Havana. So there is a transnational space of uh, the San Isidro movement is working transnationally. It is in Miami. It is in Spain. It is in Cuba, and these people um, retroactively send food for thought, send ideas, send support contacts, and of course, um, uh, finance um, money to help uh, with the movement and, and help with the campaigns in Cuba. And this made a huge difference compared to what happened 20 years ago. Now we have a, a question from Christine Dijkstra who says uh, greetings from Vermont. And she uh, mentions that uh, you have talked about some artists who have refused to join uh, the union of artists and and writers in Cuba or could not get in. And she's thinking of Juan Carlos Flores, but also wondering how many of these people that you have met um, have done so. And if you can comment further on any patterns in, for example, who, who and, and what uh, uh, arenas of art have done so. Of course, the performative, uh, the performative uh, type of uh, art was, uh, was extremely difficult to, um, it was extremely difficult for them to get into uh, the UNIAC. Um, it was uh, it was difficult to have it uh, recognized, and even Arte Calle, they had uh, they were very famous at the time, and they they, they had they encountered great difficulty in being recognized as real artists. So I do believe there is also a professional reason, a professional logic uh, behind the fact that it's not being recognized by UNIAC, but not only um, um, not only the fact that they were mostly working collectively rather than individually. It also, of course, uh, went against uh, one of the logics of, uh, of art today, like you have to be a name and you have to be a single individual name. Of course, there are groupings, but you're always looking for the individual trajectory, the individual um, work of art. So this was, a, this was a, a difference. And in the end, of course, so you have our artistic logics behind it, and, but you also had the political logics. Um, Amnison Franca, for instance, was always a group that was closely monitored, uh, Fernando Rojas was taking um, was uh, taking care of them personally. He came sometimes to the gallery to tell them, look, you should not do this, you should not talk to these people, uh, especially you should not talk to you any Sanchez. So the political uh, aspect of it was also important. Of course, it was not the only one. And, and thank you for this question because it allowed me also to, uh, to talk about um, artistic, specific artistic underpinnings for not being able to get into Winnipeg. Okay. Um, since we don't have any more questions, um, let me ask you a couple more of my own. Um, a basic one for me is, uh, in your presentation, you have shown the increasing uh, role of Afro-Cubans uh, in this uh, movement, particularly in San Isidro. Can you reflect on that? Why does it appear now to be uh, a more inclusive uh, movement uh, racially than some of the other groups that you mentioned in the 1960s? Well, first of all, a lot of um, those movements and collectives that emerged at the end of the 90s and especially in the 2000s, they were self-taught. They, they had not gone through um, like academias like San Alejandro, like um, the ISA, the Instituto Superior de Arte, or other, other uh, art schools or University of Havana, or, you know. Um, even the intellectual voices that were part of that movement, they had often studied at the pedagogicos, like less uh, strategic, less uh, prestigious um, establishments uh, for different reasons. Uh, a lot of them came from uh, working class backgrounds and uh, 
I don't know, they didn't have access. Some of them told me they tried and they never had access to those institutions. Some of them just never knew about them. Uh, Luis Manuel Otero de Cantar himself, he was an athlete before he became an artist. Um, so they were actually interested in art, but coming from different backgrounds. Uh, Amaury Pacheco, he started uh, doing art or, or, or David Escalona, uh, both from Omni because as, as a living, because they thought they could do some kind of artesanias and, and sell them to tourists at, at some time at a point where they didn't have any other ways of uh, making a living. So it, this was one thing others told me because they didn't have anything to do in the, in the 90s and they were so people dancing break dance because it was big at the time. You could pick up some radios coming from the US and they started doing break dance and it was mostly urban youth and black people doing um, break dance. And that's how a, a whole bunch of people got together and got into gigs and parties and listened to music and rap music and started being interested in art, but coming from from scratch from the grassroots and they self-taught one another with what they knew with people they started to um they started to uh to have relationship with and uh, for instance um the some people who were themselves afro-cubans and had made card a, a space for themselves within institutions like roberto surbano or like um thomas fernandez at the um at the um, library, the um, Jose Marti um, library, those people were important for them because uh, they talked about this. What, what is it to be an Afro-Cuban and to be an intellectual or to be an artist or to be in the uh, world of, of arts in Cuba? And this uh, allowed them to have conversations about racism, et cetera. This doesn't mean it was very, cent very central at the time. It didn't, the, 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 they were not anti-racist uh, activists. But I just believe this allowed new people to work together and to uh, learn from one another from the margins because they didn't manage to get a space or they came from families that didn't have the information that allowed them to be able to study there. And then they managed to have this kind of connections with Tanya Bouguera, for instance, who recognized this work or with um, Reina Maria Rodriguez who recognized their work and other people who recognized their work. And that's how they got connected to the, to the arts world that was more um, in the at the center, let's say, and get this kind of recognition from these people who themselves occupied a kind of a critical space at the center. Okay, one one final question that I have for you. I mean, you mentioned already the role of social media and the internet, but I, I think that uh, it's an important topic to perhaps develop. Can you say a little more about that? Uh, of course, uh, this is a major difference between what happened in the 2000s and what happens today, because yes. at the time, the objective of everybody was to work under the radar and not to be seen that everything was a bit uh, clandestine. People were talking, it was word of mouth. It, nothing was very publicly, uh, or vis not, not too public, not too visible. This has changed a lot. And it had changed also because today, if you look at the composition of the San Isidro movement, Half of them either work regularly for news outlets or are journalists themselves. So you have this connection between the art world and the world of independent um, journalism, which has become uh, really strong. And so it's not just about social media, but it's also the fact that people doing independent art are also connected with people doing independent journalism and connected to people who are uh, political opponents. So this is this is what I call the desegmentation is that you have people who normally belong to different kind of social spheres who talk together and they talk together because they all share a, a specific position which is one of uh, criticism or position to the government. That's how they met and that's how they started talking to, to one another and this, that's what makes it today a kind of articulated front. It's not a unified front, it's an articulated front, articulated front of different claims and that's why it gives it its, its strength I believe. Thank you, marie -Laure. Now we've uh, reached the end of our talk. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for this virtual lecture, and we hope to see you soon. Goodbye. Well, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Sure.